today's brief khutbah, I'd like to share with you an important reminder, something that's always relevant to every Muslim, something that never becomes overset, overstated, something that you and I need as much of as we need the oxygen that we breathe. In this particular ayah that I'd like to share with you from Surah Al-Hadid, Allah Azza wa Jal basically takes a few words and draws a snapshot of my entire life. I mean, this is part of the elephants and the comprehensive nature of Allah's words. And He says very few things, but they capture very big lessons. And in these few words, Allah Azza wa Jal has basically drawn a, a comprehensive image, a comprehensive illustration of our entire life. And he begins with the words, I'lamu. And this is Allah in, in the fitted umr form telling us to, you know, in the English expression we'd say, no, but really you had better come to know. You had better realize. Anna malhayatul dunya. Worldly life amounts to nothing more than, and then he goes on. So whatever he's about to say, that's all this worldly life is worth. Or that's all we're up to in this life. And he says the first thing, ma'ibun. Which is curious because we all know when you're children, and those of you that have children like myself, what is the most important thing to a child, a baby? Besides eating and sleeping, they want to be played with, tickled. They want to be carried, thrown around. That's what they want to do, it's playing. That's the most important thing to them. Their world revolves around playing. But our children, they grow older, and as they grow older, you saw this with your own eyes, your children don't just want to play anymore, they want you to tell them a story. They want to sing along with you. They want to watch cartoons or something. They want to be entertained. This urge not just to play, but to entertain oneself comes into comes and takes hold inside oneself. So Allah Azza wa Jalla says, لَعِبٌ وَلَهْوٌ Entertainment. He adds, first he says games. Just play. And then he says entertainment. And then we get past that stage too. This, you know, confused state between adulthood and childhood. Right? These, these, these years where you're in between, and you're just discovering that you're turning into an adult. This is an age mostly ascribed to the teenage years, especially in our culture, you'll notice something. And this is probably true of cultures around the world. At that young age, a man and a woman is very obsessed with how they look. They're very obsessed with their appearance, and the beautification of the things around them. They're obsessed with that. You have young men and women come to the masjid, and they'll check themselves out in every reflection of every car in the parking lot before they get in here. They're going to make sure their hair is the way they want it to be. They're going to spend 45 minutes in front of a mirror before they come out of the bathroom and go to school. They're going to make sure their t-shirt matches their jeans or something. Are they wearing the right brand of clothes before they walk into, you know, into their high school? There's this obsession with beautification. There's this obsession with being trendy. Or being looked at as you know, some, someone worthy of being looked at. And one's worth starts being determined by how they look. And so children, at this age, they start going through depression if they think they look ugly, or they have freckles or something. They start going through depression. Allah Azza wa Jal says, لَعِبٌ وَلَهْوٌ وَزِينَةٌ Beautification. And this is a stage in life. But you know, you get over that too, you move on. We don't stay in that stage, we mature and we go get past it. And once you get past it, you know, in our term, in our times, you get into college, you want to graduate with a good, you know, good program, you want to get a decent job, you know, you want, you want to be in a competitive field, and so on and so forth. Now in this stage of life, basically what, what takes over is this urge to prove yourself. You know, when you graduate from college, your diploma, it could sit inside a shelf in your, in your storage closet, but where does it go? You hang it up on the wall. Anybody that comes over, look what I accomplished. Look at my new ID for my job. The car even comes with it. You want to see my new, you know, look at my, you know, my transcript. Look at this award I got. Look at the picture I took with the dean of the school. There's this urge to show everybody else what you have accomplished. There's this urge that you, your accomplishments shouldn't be left to yourself. So Allah Azza wa Jal says, وَتَفَاقُرُ بَيْنَكُمْ An urge to basically compete and to show off essentially to one another. <laughs> this is an urge we have inside of us, to prove ourselves almost. We feel like we're worth nothing if we haven't accomplished certain tasks in the worldly sense. Otherwise, what are we worth? What are we worth in this society if we don't have a respectable job, or a good degree, or something like that? 
So what the Fakhrum Baynakum just takes over. But even that stage passes, you're not concerned with showing yourself off to anybody anymore. You get married, you have children. And those of you that are married and have children, one of the things that you can share with me is this, this bug that gets planted into our heads. So every waking moment there are two things that are constantly running in your mind. It's either the money or the kids. Two things. How much balance is left? How much did we spend on the bills this week? Right? Every morning before you get into the car and you recite your dua for traveling, you make sure you look and check see how much did the stocks fall this morning. You're concerned about money. It's something that's obsessed you. And on the other hand, where are the kids going to go to school? Where are they going to go to college? How am I going to pay for their marriage? How are we, how are we going to live in a rental house for so long? We got to get a, we got to buy a home. I have to think about my children's future. These two things almost invade your mind. So Allah Azza wa adds in the culmination, in this final stage, وَتَكَاثُرُمْ فِي الْأَمْوَالِ وَالْأَوْلَادِ This mutually shared, you know, sentiment that we all have to gain plenty, to have stability in two things, in terms of money, in terms of assets, and in terms of children. We want to have this safety net. You know, we don't even know if we're going to live to see the next day, let alone the next hour. But we want to make sure we have savings that will last us 20 years. Or that we can think 50 years in advance. We want to have that sense of stability. It takes over our minds. And this is basically one race to another. When a child is running after games and play, and then after entertainment, and then after beautification, and then to prove himself, and then to gain stability and saving. Those of you that are younger in the audience, you're like, I don't care about saving money. Wait till you get to be 30. Wait till you get to be 40, then we'll talk. Those of you that are younger, you say, well, I don't care about buying a home or living in an apartment. It doesn't matter to me. But when you get to a certain age, what does everybody want? Across this world, you don't even speak their language. What do you want with your money? I want to buy a house. I want to stay, I want to stay in somewhere permanent. I want to have permanent residence. <laughs> That's a shared sentiment in humanity. And Allah Azza wa in His infinite mercy, what does He offer believers? He offers them a home. He offers them some way they can stay, and they can stay permanently, subhanAllah. In another place, again a similar ayah before we come to the conclusion of this ayah. In another place in Surah Al-Hajj, Allah Azza wa Jalla at the end of a passage, a profound passage, which is an ayah in and of itself, He gives us an axiom, a principle in life. And because of the shortage of time, I'd like to share just the last part of that ayah. Though the entire ayah is profound. Allah Azza wa Jalla concludes the ayah saying, "Darfa Talibu al Matlub." He says, "Darfa Talibu al Matlub." It's a short statement, and the rough English translation would be, "The seeker and the sought are inherently weak." The seeker and the sought are inherently weak. This sounds difficult. Sounds like SAT English. So I'll try and simplify it for you and myself. Essentially, what the ayah is telling us is, in this world, everybody is seeking something. Everybody is running after something. Everybody is obsessed with something. They want something really bad. And those who are running after stuff, they are weak. And whatever they're running after is also weak, is also flawed. Let me think about this. Just practical experience. Your children, they see an ad on TV. Some new movie comes out. Some new video game comes out. Some new video game entertainment system comes out. Something comes out. They're bothering you at Eve. Can I get that for Eve? Can you get that for me? Please, I got good grades. Can you let me buy? Can you go to the video game store now? Can we get to the toy store now? Are you going to buy me those shoes now? Etc. Etc. They really want it. They, they can't sleep at night. They're thinking about that new game. They're thinking about whatever you know game system there is. And when you get it for them, how about what for them? You get it for them, and they're really happy. How long since? How long does it last that they're still obsessed with that same game or those same shoes or that same? Television, whatever it was. It lasts a week, two weeks, and they move on to the next thing. Another movie came out. And this happens to adults. You and I, you know, we're saving up some money to get a car. And you've been looking at the website every few hours, you check out the 3D view, you've checked out the different color matching of the interiors, right? You know every last statistic, the useless statistic, by the way, there is to know about this car, and you finally get it. You finally get it. You're really happy. How long before the, another, the next model comes out and you say, Oh my goodness, they curved the tail lights a little differently. I, that's amazing, I have to get that one. I feel insecure in mine now. SubhanAllah, we move from one to the next, to the next, to the next. You know when you were living with a roommate in college, 
yeah, this is the good life. And then he said, when you got an apartment, you said, wow, this is big. But soon after, he said, an apartment's not going to cut it, I got to get a house. And once you get a house, you go to your friend's house, and their house is nicer. And your wife says, did you see their curtains? Did you see their backyard? He said, yeah, we got to start thinking. You know? So you start comparing. There's always something more. There's always the next car. There's always the next house. There's always the next thing. So we are weak because every time we find, we, we, look, we look for something that will satisfy us, it disappoints us. And something else comes and we run after that. And that disappoints us too. And then we run after the next thing and it disappoints us too. And this is the state of humanity. It should not be the state of the believer. The believer is above these things. Allah Azza wa Jal, in that ayah, he didn't begin with Ya Ayyuhal Ladina Amanu by the way, he said Ya Ayyuhal Nas. This is a problem for human beings. But the believers are a step above as the ayah continues. And you know the very next ayah Allah Azza wa Jal, interestingly enough, he says, Ma qadarullaha haqqa qadrihi, inna allaha la qawiyyul aziz. The previous ayah mentions bu'ah, weakness. Weakness of who? The human being. And the next ayah mentions strength. But whose strength? Whose power? Allah Azza wa Jal. It's a, it's a direct lesson. They didn't appreciate Allah like He deserved to be appreciated. Because if we run after the pleasure of Allah, if that is the thing that makes me lose my sleep at night, if that's the thing I'm running after, then Wallahi, I become strong. Because I'm running after the one who is the source of all strength. You run after anything else in life and you are as weak as that thing is. I'll give you a couple of practical examples. I had a chance, I will compare Inam Muslim with a Muslim scenario in a contemporary time. You know, in, in abnormal psychology, I was, I was a student of abnormal psychology, and we studied the case of this young man who's brilliant. He did his PhD in psychology at NYU. And back in the days when he did his PhD, he typed up his entire thesis, left it at the front desk, and walked away, and the secretary or the administration, they lost his thesis. They lost his PhD thesis. He didn't even have a copy. No. So his years of work has now basically been washed away. There's nothing there. So what happens to this person? You see, he was seeking something. He was seeking that credential. He was seeking finally that he will, he will earn that title. That's what he was seeking. And because he was seeking other than Allah, he was weak. And you know what happened to him? He collapsed mentally. He goes around the campus, even today, it's been decades. He goes around NYU campus and he tells people, don't go here, they'll steal your thesis, it's a rip-off school, and every few weeks they have to take him into Bellevue. He lost his sanity. Because he lost that which he was after. Compare this to another scenario. By the you know, grace of Allah Azza wa Jal, I had the opportunity to visit New Orleans after Katrina. And you know there's a big Muslim community in New Orleans. Even one of the masajid was completely crushed. Anyway, I had the chance to meet a a gentleman who's a car dealer. This Muslim brother, he, him, you know, he didn't want to deal with any sort of riba, so he bought all his luxury cars cash. Alhamdulillah. And his lot was on the water. So when the storm came, the only car that survived is the Lexus that he escaped in. Everything else was gone. Everything else was gone. I mean, if you're in business, and if your sales are going down by 10%, by 20% in a month, you start getting depression, and you start having high blood pressure, and you start need, you need to be, go see a doctor. You start flipping out. And this person lost basically everything, and he delivers pizza at the Lexus that he escaped in now. Yet there's a smile on his face. There's a smile on his face. Why? Because that's not what he was after. He says to me, you know, I am grateful to Allah because I used to go to sleep thinking about the numbers, thinking about how many sales, how much money. Now I go to sleep making dhikr of Allah. This is a gift of Allah to me. And that's a believer. That's a believer. So there's a difference in attitude. And so now we turn to the last portion of the ayah that I started with. اِعْلَمُوا أَنَّمَا الْحَيَاةُ الدُّنْيَا لَعِبٌ وَلَهْبٌ وَزِينَةٌ وَتَفَاخُرٌ بَيْنَكُمْ وَتَكَاثُرٌ فِي الْأَمْوَالِ وَالْأَوْلَادِ Allah takes all of that subhanahu wa ta'ala and He gives it an analogy. He wants us to understand worldly life by means of a beautiful parable. It's a profound statement. Allah Azza wa Jal says, كَمَثَلِ غَيْثٍ أَعْجَبَ الْكُفَّارُ نَمَاتٍ It's like heavy rain. You know, really pouring rain. That, you know, the farmer who planted the seed 
But at the time that the farmer is planting the seed one at a time, going all over the field in the burning sun, does he see the fruit of his labor at that time? No. But he's hopeful that eventually what's going to happen? It's going to rain. And now finally at the end of the year, I'm going to get to see my work come through. So Allah describes this farmer, he uses the word kufar because that's the, 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 the element of farming when you're planting the seed. So he's, getting, he's ready to see the fruit of his labor come out. He is impressed. He loves the fact that now his, the, you know, the, the crop is coming out. Then Allah mentions even better. Then it matures. And you know, farming 101, when your crop matures, what are you supposed to do? Harvest, you cut it. You take advantage of it. But Allah mentions something strange. He says, This farmer who was happy that his crop is about to mature, the next thing Allah tells us is that crop turned yellow. You will see it turn yellow. فَتَرَوْهُ مُصْفَرَ ثُمَّ يَكُونُ قُطَامًا Then it will turn into crust. He had all of his expectations in that farm, and yet that farm is allowed to turn to crust. Nothingness. The thing that he aspired towards is gone. And then Allah says, وَفِي الْآخِرَةِ عَذَابٌ شَدِيدٌ And in the end, there are only two things. Severe punishment, وَمَغْفِرَةٌ مِّنَ اللَّهِ وَلِقْوَانِ Forgiveness from Allah and contentment, and great contentment. Now may Allah Azza wa Jal make us worthy of His forgiveness. And may Allah please with us. And then He concludes, and we conclude, وَمَا الْحَيَاةُ الدُّنْيَا إِلَّا مَتَعَرْضُونَ What is worldly life? Except means by which, you know, people are deceived. Means of deception. That's all worldly life amounts to. And please don't take my, my statements the wrong way. I'm not saying you shouldn't have a nice job, or a nice house, or a nice car, or nice clothes. I'm not saying any of that. But if those are the things that are in your heart, not just in your bank, if those are the things that in your heart, not just in your pocket, then you've got a serious problem. And you can have that serious problem even if you have nothing in your pocket. And there's dunya in your hearts. And you can be the wealthiest man in the world, but dunya is not in your heart. This is not the only thing you're running after. You realize there's something more. There's something more. I leave you with a warning that Allah Azza wa Jal revealed about those who are declared hypocrites. And may Allah protect us from hypocrisy. But one of the punishments on the hypocrites that Allah mentions in Surah At-Tawbah, it deals with this subject. Allah says, فَلَا تُعْجِبْكَ أَمْوَالُهُمْ وَلَا أَوْلَادُهُمْ Don't allow their money on their, or their children, the accomplishments of their children even, right? Don't let that deceive you. Don't be impressed with it. Don't be impressed with it. إِنَّمَا يُرِيدُ اللَّهُ لِيُعَذِّبَهُمْ بِهَا Allah only intends to punish them with it. Allah only intends to punish them by means of their wealth, by means of their children. It's a shocking statement. I travel across the country, subhanAllah, small towns and big towns, I've seen about 60 communities, Muslim communities, all over the country. One of the most common things I see is, a parent comes to me and says, Brother, can you talk to my teenage son? Can you talk to my, my college-going daughter? They're really not listening to me anymore. They've rebelled. I don't know what to do with them. And I ask them, what were you doing for the last 12 years? What were you doing for the last 15 years? I was, going, I was working double overtime. I was putting extra hours in my business so I could save money, so my children could go to what? College. I did everything for them. You see, that's the problem already. The intentions were all messed up. And what happens? Those very children who you give your life for, you give hours of sleep up for your children. Those very children, when they slam the door on your face and run away from home, and cause embarrassment to your family, they become, they become a means of torture. Those same children, that same money, it becomes a means of torture. Why? Because we didn't run after the pleasure of Allah and Lord. May Allah make us realize, especially those that are responsible, and every one of us is in some sphere of responsibility, that we have to make sure that the people under us, they, they realize there's a bigger goal in life. We aspire to something higher. And the things in this world, they may be there for us to use, but the love, the love in our hearts needs to be for the world that awaits us. The world that Allah Azza wa Jal has promised us if we fulfill His commandments and seek His forgiveness.